If you have driven or hiked along a mountain road, you have likely seen massive concrete walls holding back tons of earth. Ever wondered why they are there? Well, it's because of the stability of the soil. And stability of soil depends on the slope of its surface. When the slope is steeper than what is considered safe, the soil becomes unstable and can collapse. Well, on the other hand, if the slope is gentle and flatter than the critical angle, it's much safer. But what if there is no space to create that gentle slope and a steeper slope is unavoidable? In such cases, a supporting structure is built to keep the soil in place. So when the soil needs to be held back at a steep angle, we create these walls structures designed to provide the lateral support necessary to keep the earth from moving. These structures are called retaining walls. Without a retaining wall, the soil from the steep slope would slide down, making the slope unstable. The soil that the wall is holding back exerts pressure on the wall, and this pressure is called earth pressure. However, the term earth pressure can sometimes cause confusion as it could refer to either vertical or horizontal or both the forces exerted by the soil. To be more specific, the horizontal force exerted on the wall is called lateral earth pressure. Now designing a retaining wall isn't as simple as stacking up concrete. It requires careful calculations of the magnitude or the amount of force with which the soil is pushing against the wall and exactly where that force is acting. The magnitude of this force depends on few more factors like the rigidity or flexibility of the wall, the relative movement of the soil and structure, the type of soil the wall is supporting and even the drainage conditions around it. As we can see, there are a lot of factors at play here. And because of that, determining earth pressure isn't always straightforward. It's often statically indeterminate, meaning there is no single direct equation to solve for it. But to make things more manageable, we break a lateral earth pressure down into three main types. At rest earth pressure, active earth pressure and passive earth pressure. First, let's look into the at rest earth pressure. When a retaining wall is completely rigid, meaning it does not tilt, slide or deform, it holds the soil in place, preventing it from expanding outward or being compressed inward. In this condition, the horizontal stresses in the soil remain in equilibrium. The lateral pressure acting on the wall in this state is called at rest earth pressure. Then there is active earth pressure. Unlike at a rest condition, where the wall is rigid, here the wall actually moves just a little. This movement can happen for many reasons. Vibrations from the traffic, erosion of the soil behind the wall, temperature changes causing the wall material to expand or contract, poor construction, or even the swelling and shrinking of clay soils. Now, as the wall moves away from the soil, the soil right next to it wants to separate from the rest of the soil mass. But soil has shear strength, which resists this movement and holds it together. The wall doesn't actually move this much, and this is just exaggerated for a better view. In reality, it stays in contact with the soil. As now soil begins to hold itself together, the lateral pressure acting on the wall starts to decrease. If the wall keeps moving, a point comes where the soil's full shear strength is completely reached. Beyond this point, the soil can no longer hold its shape. It fails along a slip surface. At this moment, the pressure on the wall is at its minimum. This lowest possible Lateral earth pressure acting on the wall is called active earth pressure. Now let's talk about passive earth pressure. 
which is basically the opposite of active earth pressure. This time, instead of the wall moving away from the soil, it moves towards it, compressing the soil against itself. The soil resists this movement due to its shear strength, which pushes back against the wall. As a result, the horizontal pressure acting on the wall keeps increasing. If the wall keeps pushing into the soil, a point comes where the soil's shear strength is completely used up. At this stage, the soil can no longer resist, it fails. And at this moment, the pressure on the wall is at its maximum. This highest possible lateral pressure acting on the wall is called passive earth pressure. So, in simple terms, active earth pressure is a minimum lateral pressure a wall can experience, while the passive earth pressure is the maximum. In both the cases, the soil is at the point of failure, either because of its expanding and breaking apart or getting compressed to its limit. So, we now understand the different types of earth pressure at rest, active and passive. But the big question is, how do we actually calculate these pressures? Well, one of the simplest and most widely used methods was given by a clever engineer from the Scotland, William John McCorn Rankin. Yeah, quite a name to remember. We just call it Rankin's theory. Before moving further, I ask you to support Elementary Engineering on Patreon or join the channel here on YouTube if you like the videos and also to unlock members-only content. Some people also pronounce it as a Rankine, but the more common pronunciation, especially in engineering circles, is a Rankine. Now, a Rankine made few assumptions to simplify the calculations of earth pressure. He considered the soil to be perfectly elastic and homogeneous, meaning its properties are the same everywhere. He also assumed that the retaining wall is smooth, so no friction between the wall and the soil. To keep things simple, he worked with dry and cohesionless soil. And importantly, he assumed the soil surface behind the wall is perfectly level not sloped, so the stress distribution remains uniform. Now imagine a tiny element of soil at some depth z. This little guy is under two types of stress. Vertical stress from the weight of the soil above it and horizontal stress from the surrounding soil pushing in. The vertical stress sigma z on this soil element is simply due to the weight of the soil above it. And since the weight is just a unit weight of soil, gamma multiplied by depth of it, z. Since no shear stresses act on these horizontal and vertical planes, sigma z and sigma x are the principal stresses. And we initially assume a sigma z as the major principal stress, sigma 1, and sigma x as the minor principal stress, sigma 3. But keep in mind that this is just an assumption. In most natural soil conditions, a vertical stress, sigma z, is usually greater than horizontal stress, sigma x. Makes sense, right? The weight of all the soil above is pressing down more than the sideways push from the surrounding soil. Now, we can actually visualize these stresses using a Mohr circle, which is a very useful way of representing stress conditions. To understand the concept of principal stresses and Mohr circle, do watch the shear strength video. We discuss these in a later detail there. We mark these stresses on the graph and plot the Mohr circle. Now, when the wall moves away from the soil, the horizontal stress sigma x starts decreasing. If the wall keeps moving away, sigma x keeps reducing until it officially becomes the minor principal stress, sigma 3, while the vertical stress, sigma z, takes over as major principal stress, sigma 1. 
With this, the Mohr circle keeps growing and when the stress reaches a point where the soil is about to fail, the Mohr circle touches the failure envelope, which is basically the soil's strength limit. At this stage, the soil mass is said to be in the active Rankine state. We know that the angle of failure envelope is written as phi. This represents the internal friction between the soil particles. Now, if we look at the triangle formed by failure envelope, the stress axis and radius of Mohr circle, we can write sin phi as this. Solving for sigma 3, we get this. Here, sigma 3 represents the active lateral pressure at failure, which is denoted as Pa. And sigma 1 is just the vertical stress which we already defined as gamma z. This term is commonly written as Ka, which is called the coefficient of active earth pressure. So putting it all together, we get the expression for calculating the lateral earth pressure on soil in active condition. Now just like this, let's analyze what happens to a small soil element at depth z when the wall is pushing into the soil. Again, the soil element experiences similar two stresses, vertical stress due to the weight of the soil above it and the horizontal stress due to the surrounding soil pressure. We can again draw the Mohr circle for this condition, but this time as the wall pushes into the soil, the horizontal stress sigma x increases. If this increase continues, sigma x eventually becomes a greater than the vertical stress and takes the role of major principal stress, sigma 1, while sigma z becomes the minor principal stress, sigma 3. Even though its value hasn't changed, it's now the smaller of the two. With this increasing horizontal stress, the Mohr circle grows, and if the compression keeps going to the point of failure, the Mohr circle touches the failure envelope, marking the moment when the soil reaches its passive Rankine state. Now, if you look at the triangle formed by the failure envelope, the stress axis and the radius of the Mohr circle, we can write sin phi as this. This time, solving for sigma 1, as this is the horizontal pressure. In this case, sigma 1 corresponds to the passive lateral earth pressure at failure, which we denote as PP. Sigma 3 is the vertical stress, gamma z, and this ratio is called Kp, the coefficient of passive earth pressure. So we can now express the lateral earth pressure in the passive state as this. While Rankine's theory is simple and effective, it makes a few assumptions that may not always match real-world conditions. For example, theory assumes soil surface is level behind the wall. But if the soil behind the wall is sloped, it changes the pressure distribution. The theory also assumes the surface of the walls as smooth. But in reality, walls aren't perfectly smooth. Rough walls increase friction, reducing active pressure and increasing passive pressure. Additionally, Rankine's theory assumes dry, cohesionless soil. But in wet conditions, hydrostatic pressure increases lateral pressure, and drainage systems may be needed. Finally, while Rankine's theory is for cohesionless soils only, but it was extended for cohesive soils also, where the failure envelope includes a cohesion intercept which was zero for cohesionless soils. So next time you see a retaining wall on a mountain road or anywhere holding back soil, you know how much thought and engineering went into making sure it stays stable and safe. It's not simply a pile of concrete. It's carefully designed to handle the forces of earth behind it. I would like to thank my patron for supporting elementary engineering financially. Also, if you think elementary engineering has given you knowledge that worth something to you, consider supporting this channel on Patreon and get access to the questions and their solutions related to the various topics of soil mechanics.
Your support will help me continue my journey of creating more such valuable content. You can also support me here on YouTube by joining this channel and get access to the members only content. Spreading a word about elementary engineering will also be of great help. Only your love and support keeps elementary engineering going. You can find the links of books and other sources I referred for the creation of this video in the description. Read Rankin's theory of earth pressure on elementaryengineeringlibrary.com. Thank you.